Hey there, this is Absite and Board Review for the stomach. Let's start with anatomy. Stomach parts are the cardia, the angle of his, the fundus, the body, the incisor angularis, the antrum, and the pylorus. The blood supply is from the left gastric artery, which is a branch of the celiac, and the right gastric artery, which comes off of the hepatic artery. The right gastroepiploic artery is a branch of the gastroduodenal, and it runs along the greater curve and connects with the left gastroepiploic artery, which is fed by the short gastric vessels coming from the spleen. The vagus nerve twists so that the mnemonic LARP stands for left vagus anterior at the GE junction and the right vagus is posterior. Next, the physiology of the stomach is big on tests. Know that the chief cells make pepsinogen, the peppy chief mnemonic, which is converted to pepsin in the stomach, which helps digest proteins. There are mucus producing cells, which are the most common cell of the stomach. The hormonal cells include antral G cells, which make the hormone gastrin, which increases acid production. There are also D cells, which make somatostatin, which decreases acid and pancreas secretion. The parietal cells make intrinsic factor, which helps absorb B12 in the terminal ileum. Parietal cells also make the hydrochloric acid. The production of acid uses an exchange of H and potassium ATPase, and this is the enzyme that is blocked by proton pump inhibitors. Things that stimulate acid production are histamine, acetylcholine from the vagus nerve, and gastrin. H2 blockers prevent the action of histamine. Next, know about H. pylori. It is related to peptic ulcer disease, maltomas, and gastric cancers. Presence of H. pylori can be tested several ways. One way is by endoscopy and doing either a direct biopsy with culture for H. pylori or a CLO test, which stands for Campylobacter-like organism, which is done on endoscopic biopsy and is testing for the presence of urease activity. Another common test is a urea breath test since the H. pylori can convert ammonia to urea and carbon dioxide, you can actually test the breath for radiolabeled carbon dioxide as a sign that there is active H. pylori in the stomach. There is a serum H. pylori antibody test, which will remain positive even after treatment. If somebody has H. pylori, you should treat them with triple therapy, which includes bismuth and two antibiotics, usually amoxicillin with tetracycline. The best proof of cure after treatment for H. pylori is the urea breath test. Let's talk about peptic ulcer disease. Know the gastric ulcer types. Type 1 gastric ulcers are located near the incisura on the lesser curve and are associated with low to normal acid production. Type 2 gastric ulcers are associated with two types of ulcer, one in the duodenum and one in the stomach. These are generally associated with high acid output. Type 3 gastric ulcers are associated with high acid output and are usually prepyloric. Type 4 gastric ulcers are usually high on the lesser curve near the GE junction and are known as a Sendes ulcer. Type 5 gastric ulcers are diffused throughout the stomach and are related to NSAID use. Cushing's ulcers are related to head trauma and Curling's ulcers are stress ulcers related to burn injuries. A few general rules about gastric ulcers. Always biopsy them on endoscopy since they have a higher risk of cancer. If a gastric ulcer is over 3 cm in size at diagnosis, I would remove the area surgically. If it is less than 3 cm in size, then test for H. pylori. If H. pylori is positive, treat that and give the patient PPI treatment also for about 6 to 12 weeks. Then rescope to see if the ulcer is completely healed. If the ulcer persists after three months or six months or so of treatment, you should go ahead and remove it surgically to make sure it's not cancer. And because it's not healing with treatment, it's called a recalcitrant gastric ulcer. The following are the elective surgery options for recalcitrant gastric ulcers in this scenario that they are just not healing. The emergency surgeries will be discussed later. Type one ulcers just need resection with distal gastrectomy and no vagotomy since acid production is normal. 
The best surgery for type 2 and 3 gastric ulcers is a vagotomy and antrectomy with either a Billroth 1 or a Billroth 2 reconstruction. Billroth 1 is pulling the duodenum up and Billroth 2 is traditionally a loop gastrojejunostomy. This is a good answer for type 2 and type 3 ulcers because it decreases acid by cutting the vagus and also removing the antral G cells and also removes the ulcer itself. Type 4 or the Sendez ulcer is treated with a distal gastrectomy that can include a tongue of tissue up the lesser curve to include the area of the ulcer. This is known as the Pauché surgery or something called a kelling madeliner procedure which is a distal gastrectomy where you leave the ulcer and just biopsy it to make sure it's not a cancer. Know the general vagotomy surgery types. A truncal vagotomy with an antrectomy has the lowest ulcer recurrence rate at 1-2% to because you are removing the antral G cells and the vagal stimulation. A truncal vagotomy will abolish the pylorus relaxation, so a pyloroplasty is done if the antrectomy is left in place. So a vagotomy and pyloroplasty, or VNP, has about a 5-10% to ulcer recurrence risk. The last one is a highly selective vagotomy, or HSV, or a parietal cell vagotomy. This is cutting the branches of the vagus from five centimeters up the esophagus, being sure to cut the criminal nerve of Grassi in the upper stomach posteriorly, and leave the branches the last five centimeters going to the pylorus called the crow's feet. Highly selective vagotomy has an ulcer recurrence rate of 10 to 15%, but it has the least morbidity and least dumping syndrome. After a highly selective vagotomy, liquids empty faster because the receptive relaxation of the stomach is gone. Solids empty about the same rate. A highly selective vagotomy is a good answer for intractable duodenal ulcer disease. Other than intractability, the urgent indications for surgery for gastric and duodenal ulcers are bleeding, perforation, and obstruction. Since the thought process is different for duodenal ulcer versus gastric ulcer, I would approach them separately. For a bleeding duodenal ulcer, it is usually on the posterior wall and is bleeding from the gastroduodenal and the transverse pancreatic arteries. So you need to do a three-point ligation above, below, and to the right side of the bleeding ulcer. Since most bleeding duodenal ulcers will have high acid, doing the vessel ligation through an anterior duodenotomy, which extends through the pylorus, then you can close this with the pyloroplasty and do a truncal vagotomy, so you've done a V and P is a good answer. If there is an anterior perforated duodenal ulcer and a posterior bleeding one at the same time, this is called a kissing ulcer. An anterior perforated duodenal ulcer alone, typically you would just do a gram patch on these. Now for gastric ulcers. Always start by trying to understand if a patient has been treated with PPI or for H. pylori in the past and whether this is a recalcitrant ulcer disease that just happens to have a newer complication. Someone with no previous treatment, you should probably minimize how much you do since the PPI treatment and H. pylori treatment is really successful in the vast majority. If somebody has previously treated recalcitrant disease, then you should start to consider definitive ulcer surgery if you have to operate, but it really depends entirely on how stable the patient is when you go to surgery. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about bleeding gastric ulcers. With any bleeding gastric ulcer, try endoscopy first. Indicators for failure of endoscopic therapy are visible vessels and adherent clots. If a patient rebleeds or you've transfused four or more units of blood, you should probably think about going to surgery. With a gastric ulcer that's bleeding, you should probably resect the portion of the stomach and decide if you should add some sort of vagotomy depending on the ulcer type. Next, let's talk about gastric ulcer perforation. If it is an early perforation and the patient is stable without peritonitis, maybe you could watch them really closely non-operatively. But I'd have a very low threshold to operate if they develop any peritoneal signs. If it's a late perforation, over 24 hours old, and the patient is hypotensive and septic, just try to do a gram patch and close the ulcer. And you can biopsy the ulcer either during the surgery or do a short-term follow-up endoscopy with biopsy in a few months. 
if an examiner specifically says the patient has been treated before for H. pylori or peptic ulcer disease, so this is considered a recalcitrant gastric ulcer, I would lean towards resection of the ulcer, even if it was perforated, with a vagotomy and antrectomy, as opposed to just doing a gram patch. But I would only do this if the patient was very stable. If the patient is septic, just patch it, leave a drain, and NG tube and get out. The last urgent complication is obstruction. Obstruction of the pyloric channel or the duodenum from ulcer disease is initially treated with non-operative measures. Make the patient NPO, place an NG tube, put them on TPN, and give them a PPI. Most of these obstructions resolve with conservative treatment. I would try conservative treatment for up to one week. If it does not resolve by then, then you might need to go to surgery and either do a resection or a bypass with a gastrojejunostomy. Although, be sure to biopsy the area of the stenosis very thoroughly to be sure it is not a cancer. Next, let's talk about the post-gastrectomy syndromes. Dumping is broken up into early and late dumping. Early dumping happens right after the ingestion of a meal and it's due to rapid transit of hyperosmolar fluid into the small intestine, which leads to crampy abdominal pain, dizziness, and diarrhea. Late dumping is two to three hours later as the insulin levels spike, which can cause hypoglycemia, leading to symptoms of tachycardia, sweating, and anxiety. To prevent dumping, we recommend that you eat five to six small meals a day that are high in protein and low in carbohydrate. Do not drink liquids right with the meal and do not lie down right after meals. Next, the afferent loop syndrome is dilation of the afferent loop, which is the limb of a B2 between the duodenum and the stomach. This presents with right upper quadrant pain that is relieved with bilious emesis. If you do a CT scan when the loop is obstructed, you might see a large fluid-filled structure in the right upper quadrant. Treatment is revision of the gastrojejunostomy, probably a conversion to a RUI. Bile reflux can occur most commonly after a Billroth II type reconstruction. This has symptoms of epigastric pain and heartburn symptoms. The best test to diagnose is a HIDA scan, which shows reflux of the radio tracer into the stomach and into the distal esophagus. Treatment for this is conversion to a RUI with a limb of at least 45 centimeters in length. Gastric atony or gastroparesis can occur either after surgery or in a patient with diabetes. Best test for this is a nuclear medicine gastric emptying study. Treatment is with prokinetic agents like Reglan and eating small frequent meals. Be sure to know about nutritional deficiency after gastric resection or gastric bypass surgery. You will find iron deficiency most commonly because iron is absorbed in the duodenum and needs acidification from the stomach. You will also have a lack of intrinsic factor so B12 deficiency with megaloblastic anemia can be seen. Lack of calcium since this is absorbed in the duodenum also. Let's talk about Zollerger-Ellison, ZE syndrome, or gastronomas. This is also discussed on our lecture on benign pancreas, so you can check that one out. Gastronomas are suspected when the patient has multiple duodenal and distal duodenal and jejunal ulcers, or an esophageal stricture from acid reflux. The basal acid secretion of the stomach can be high, and serum gastrin can be high. The differential for a high serum gastrin level includes things such as a retained antrum after previous gastric resection, pernicious anemia, proton pump inhibitor use. The confirmatory test for ZE is a secretin stimulation test. Normally, secretin causes a decrease in gastrin, but with a gastronoma, secretin stimulation causes a paradoxical increase in gastrin. Localization is done with a CT scan looking for a mass in the gastronoma or Passaro's triangle, which is made up of the junction of the cystic duct, common bile duct, second and third portions of the duodenum, and the head and neck of the pancreas. Octreotide scan, or a PET dotatate scan, are also good for localizing gastronomas. If a gastronoma is seen on imaging, go ahead and operate since a lot of them are malignant. If you don't see a lesion on the cross-sectional imaging, you can try an endoscopic ultrasound. Most gastronomas are sporadic, but about a quarter are related to the MEN1 syndrome with pituitary disease, parathyroid disease, and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, of which gastronoma is the most common. In an MEN1 patient, do not operate if you cannot find it preoperatively, but do operate blindly 
if, if you're dealing with a sporadic gastronoma. In a blind exploration, if you cannot find the gastronoma after a cauterization of the duodenum and ultrasound of the pancreas, you can do a duodenotomy with palpation of the submucosa of the duodenum looking for a submucosal gastronoma mass. If you can't find the gastronoma, do a vagotomy of some sort at the end of the surgery. A dulafoy lesion is a vascular malformation in the stomach wall that can bleed but can look relatively normal on the mucosa of EGD, except for maybe a pinpoint bleeding area. Treatment of a dulafoy's lesion is endoscopic, but if that doesn't work, you can try a wedge resection of the area surgically. Gastric varices can occur after splenic vein thrombosis related to chronic pancreatitis. If you actually have bleeding from gastric varices due to splenic vein thrombosis, the treatment is to do a splenectomy. Menetriere's disease is a hypertrophic gastric mucosa that leads to large rugae. This can lead to protein losing enteropathy and nutritional deficiencies. A bezoar is a gastric mass. It's made out of either hair or from plant fibers. Large hair bezoars may be hard to remove and may need a surgery to remove it from the stomach. Plant fiber bezoars can be treated non-operatively with enzymes and Coca-Cola, which can soften it up. Gastric torsion is discussed in our lecture on esophagus, but it can occur in parasophageal hernias. This is shown with Borchardt's triad, which is mid-epigastric pain, retching, and inability to pass an NG tube. Gastric volvula is associated with parasophageal hernia as a surgical emergency. The other type is twisting of the stomach on the short axis, which can be associated with ectopic or wandering spleen. This is related to abnormal attachments of the organ in the left upper quadrant. Next, let's talk about GI stromal tumors or GIST tumors. The most common location for a GIST tumor is in the stomach with about 60% of them being there. The rest are in the small bowel and colon. GIST arise from the interstitial cell of Cajal, a pacemaker cell in the GI tract. They are shown to have a CKIT mutation by staining positive for CD117. GIST tumors typically show up as normal looking mucosa, but an extra luminal mass on endoscopy and are more commonly seen on cross-sectional imaging. They are considered malignant if they are over five centimeters in size and have more than five mitoses per high-powered field. Resect to just tumors with a one to two centimeter margin of the stomach. You do not need to take lymph nodes. A lot of times this is just a wedge resection of the portion of the stomach wall. Malignant gist should be treated adjuvantly with Gleevec, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor against the CKIT pathway. Gastric lymphoma come in two types. The first is a low-grade maltoma, which is associated with H. pylori infection. Usually just treating the H. pylori makes the maltoma go away. The other is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma involving the stomach. This is just treated typically with chemotherapy. Gastric polyps are precancerous if they are hyperplastic or adenomatous. Inflammatory polyps are benign. Patients with FAP or familial adenosis polyposis and putz uger syndrome need to be screened with endoscopy for gastric cancer. Adenocarcinoma of the stomach is the next big topic. Risk factors for adenocarcinoma include smoking, blood type A, pernicious anemia, chronic gastritis, H. pylori infection, smoked or pickled foods, being from Central, South America, or Japan, and genetic syndromes such as putz uger there are two histologic types of gastric adenocarcinoma, which are called the Loren classification. The first type is intestinal type, which is better. It tends to grow as a polypoid mass. The other type is diffuse type, which tends to infiltrate throughout the stomach wall. It has signet ring cells, and it has a higher rate of peritoneal carcinomatosis. And diffuse spread throughout the stomach is called lanitis plastica. So diffuse type overall has a worse prognosis. Once a gastric adenocarcinoma is diagnosed, you should stage the patient with the CT scan and an endoscopic ultrasound. Endoscopic ultrasound is better for determining the T stage and the end stage. T1 is growth not past the muscularis. T2 is growth past the muscularis of the wall. T3 tumors grow through the serosa, and T4 tumors grow into adjacent organs. End stage is based on the number of positive lymph nodes. N1 is 1 to 2 positive lymph nodes, N2 is 3 to 6 positive lymph nodes, 
and three is seven or more nodes involved. Patients with tumor growing past the muscularis layer or positive lymph nodes should be considered for chemotherapy prior to surgery. Physical signs of metastatic disease are Virchow's node, which is a left supraclavicular node, a sister Mary Joseph nodule in the umbilicus, a bloomer shelf, which is a drop med in the pelvis, and a Krukenberg tumor, which is a metastasis to the ovary. If you're going to do a surgery on gastric adenocarcinoma, you want to have six centimeter margins on either side. If the cancer is in the distal stomach, it is okay to do a distal gastrectomy as long as there is six centimeter margins on either side. If the tumor is in the proximal stomach, just do a total gastrectomy. Removing the proximal stomach and leaving the distal stomach is not a good idea because you're leaving behind possible recurrence in the stomach and leaving behind other lymph nodes. So for any proximal gastric or cardia tumor, just do a total gastrectomy with a RUY esophagogeogenostomy. For any gastric cancer, you want to remove at least 15 lymph nodes. You will hear a lot about D1 versus D2 node dissections. Just know that in America, a D1 dissection refers to removal of the lymph nodes attached to the stomach within a few centimeters of the wall. Just a D1 dissection would only be considered for a early T1 gastric cancer. Any gastric cancer greater than T2 should have a D1 plus dissection. I define this as when we remove the perigastric nodes and also the nodes in the periportal region along the common hepatic artery and the lymph nodes along the proximal splenic artery. And you want to clean out the lymph nodes at the base of the celiac axis and the base of the left gastric artery. And you also want to be sure to remove the lymph nodes below the pylorus in the area of the right gastropopoic artery and the gastropopoic vein. As long as you are focusing on these areas and getting at least 15 nodes, that is considered good gastric cancer surgery currently in America. In Japan, the true D2 dissection that they define as removing the tail of the pancreas and the spleen is not done routinely in America. Let's talk about weight loss surgery. The types most commonly asked about are gastric banding, RUY gastric bypass, and sleeve gastrectomy, and duodenal switch surgery. Gastric banding is no longer done, but if a previous gastric band patient is having midepigastric pain or maybe a new infection around the band port, you should consider doing an endoscopy or a CT scan to see if there is band erosion into the stomach. General indications for weight loss surgery are a BMI over 40 or a BMI over 35 with comorbidities. All patients need to have psychological screening and they should have tried some non-operative weight loss regimens prior to surgery. For a RUI gastric bypass, know that early post-operative leaks can present just with tachycardia and minimal abdominal pain. An early post-operative leak is usually re-operated on. A late post-operative leak is treated either non-operatively or maybe with a stent. Know that in a patient with a RUY gastric bypass history who has a small bowel obstruction, they should be evaluated emergently for internal hernia through Peterson space. Lastly, the duodenal switch surgery bypasses most of the small intestine and has a very short common channel. This can lead to major malabsorption and a lot of nutritional deficiencies. That's all I have. Don't forget to check out the other videos. I hope that helps. Good luck.